Welcome to my channel, fellow Rotorheads. Today I'm putting an H145 from HPG through its paces in the Grand Canyon. Still a lot to learn on this one. A very different machine from the 135 by far. I think that uh, I'm going to enjoy learning how to use this. In any case, uh, we are here for the do-it-yourself collective series. This is the continuation. I wanted to talk about how we're going to finish off this box and start putting the innards into it. And so to that end, uh, I actually did want to address one thing before we start, which is that I haven't filmed everything that I wanted to. Uh, it's because I'm not a filming type of guy. Um, and so I'm going to fill in with some graphics and photos, and I hope you'll be able to understand what I'm trying to say. To start off, we left the last video with a box that was glued together. And what we want is a box that is screwed together so that we can take it apart again, put the components in, and reassemble it easily. So using the drill bit size we talked about in the last video, depending on the wood screw size you're using, you're going to drill holes that will connect the face plates into the three side plates that will allow a hole and a screw to penetrate both. And that's about 3 eighths of an inch from the edge of the face plate all the way around. Now beyond that 3 eighths of an inch requirement, it doesn't need to be super precise. You just need three screws in the back, three in the front, and a total of four on the bottom. When you're done on that side, flip the box around and drill the other face plate through. Now once you have both sides drilled, we need to define what side is what because now it's going to make a difference. The front is the side facing the front of the helicopter. The chair side is where you sit, so this box sits on your left side where your left arm will be. The other sides follow from that, but what we're going to do now is to put the screws in the drilled holes on the chair side of the box. It's easier to use a round head screw and it will give your box a cool, riveted airplane skin finish. If you prefer a flat finish and want to use the flathead screws, you should be prepared to chamfer the holes so you don't split the wood when you're screwing them in. Once you've screwed in the chair side screws, let's put the box aside and turn our attention to the collective arm, which will be the first thing we put into the box. The first thing you're going to do is get yourself a scrap piece of wood you're going to screw in the half inch flange, you're going to screw in the short threaded nipple, and turning this sideways so you can see that there's a th short threaded nipple, you screw that into the flange, you get yourself a pair of pliers or a vice grip or something like that, and you torque down really hard making sure that it's absolutely tight into the flange. As long as you're torquing down in the middle of this section, don't worry about crushing the inner threads. We're only concerned about the outer threads that we want to maintain in good shape. After you've given this a good torquing where you know it's not going to come off, go ahead and put a little grease on the outer threads because this is the joint where the collective arm is going to be moving freely and smoothly. Now we're going to unscrew the assembled unit off of the scrap wood and we're going to move it into the inside of our box. For clarity's sake, we'll use this representation. The dark lines are where the walls of the box are. Now we're not screwing anything down yet, but we are spinning on the T onto the nipple and spinning it until it just becomes tight and no further. At this point, let's go ahead and assemble the rest of the collective arm, which includes the five inch pipe with the strut attached, not shown here, the T, and the 10 inch pipe. Now for clarity we'll add the sidewalls back in and what you're looking for is to position the collective arm and specifically the flange so that you can rotate the arm so that it lays down level flat with the ground. As it lays flat it should just make contact with that sidewall and if the T is rotated in the same direction as the other T, that's fine. It can be down or towards the other T, and those two directions are fine. Now that the flange is approximately in the right position, swing the arm 
up and down, making sure that it feels smooth and doesn't run into resistance or feel like it's tightening or clunking or clanking. If it does any of that, rotate the flange in either direction so that the motion of the collective arm feels smooth and free. Now that you have the flange exactly where it needs to be, use a Sharpie or pencil to mark the holes on the flange so that you know where to drill so that you can put this flange exactly there and it's locked in the correct position and orientation. Go ahead and remove most of the collective arm and screw down that flange in its position. I do recommend that you pre-drill all the holes on this board as the wood may split because of the number of holes in it. Now that we have the flange in, let's take a step back and take a look at the overall placement of components in this general diagram. We've got the flange in. In this region, in general, we're going to have the Hall Effect sensor. And then down in the electrical box, we're going to put the main circuit board. The circuit board won't quite fit in this outlet box, so we're going to make a couple small modifications to it. Now because of the order that this thing gets assembled, we'll actually need a grounding wire first. This wire connects everything electrically together. There's a lot of metal in this design, and all of that needs to be grounded together. Otherwise, you're going to suffer disconnects and static shocks and all that kind of nonsense. So you'll need to have this wire. So let's go ahead and build that. You get three small ring terminals. They're about 30 cents a piece and you wire them up as a string. There's 10 inches between two terminals and then eight inches between the other two terminals. You can use a vise to squeeze them down if you don't have a crimper. And you can also solder them down if you're not too confident about your crimping skills. Once you've got your grounding wire together, put that aside where you won't lose it as we turn our attention back to fitting the circuit board into the metal box. So first, let's orient ourselves on the circuit board. We want the blank side up. The chip side will be facing into the metal box. And the chip side obviously has the chips on it. The blank side is mostly green. So if you put the circuit board next to the metal box, you'll notice it's just a little too long to fit. But it almost fits if you put it in diagonally. It's just one corner that ends up sticking out or would if you could knock out a few of those circles. And those things are called knockouts, so that's what we're gonna do. With the right knockouts, one corner of the circuit board will stick out with the connector, and that's okay. So identifying the correct two knockouts, if the cavity of the box is facing you, it's the upper right two knockouts. Take those out with a screwdriver or a pair of pliers or a hammer, and just pry them out and they'll come off easily. What's not as easy is that you will have to cut a channel between those two holes because the board is going to stick out in that space. So you'll have to use a pair of tin snips or some other method to cut the little strip of metal there and pull the tabs back out of the way so that the board will stick its nose out through that space. Now mounting this board firmly in place will be facilitated by the two holes that are already in the board. If we remove the two knockouts that are directly under those holes, we'll have an easier way to mount this board. Now once you have all the knockouts and channel cut out, it's time to put it back in the box. A couple of small screws in the holes provided will be enough to secure it. When you place the box in the box, make sure that you have enough clearance around the outer walls to work with. As you proceed to mount the board in the metal box, you might find it's a little cramped. So keep it in your back pocket that you can always remove the walls around the box. The box was designed to be able to be disassembled for this purpose. Now the idea here is to suspend the board in the metal box without actually touching the metal box. We want to keep the board separate from the metal box and suspend it inside of it as if it was a protective shell, which is exactly what it actually is. So rotating this image so that we can get a better look, let's take a look at it from the side. As you can see here, the board with the connector sticking out of the side of the metal box is not making contact with the box at all. And we do that with a couple of nylon standoffs. 
I bought some from Lowe's and they were a little too long. They need to be about three quarters of an inch long to suspend the board at the right height so that it doesn't touch the metal box. The nylon is a little tough so you need a kind of a nice bitey tool to cut off the end. Once you get the nylon spacers in place, you'll use one inch number four round head screws to secure the board to the box. Even though these small screws are not a danger to splitting the wood, I still think it's a good idea to pre-drill the holes so that it's easier to install the screws. Before mounting the board down, let's identify all the cables and wires that need to come out through that slot before you put the board in so that everything is available to you to connect up as needed. The first item will be the USB cable that comes off of the blank side of the board on the far end. On the chip side of the board there is a small connector in between another small connector and a bigger connector. You'll take the three wires coming off of that small connector and wrap them together with tape or tie them into a knot and bring them out through the slot. There's a set of wires coming off a large connector on the end of the board that will be sticking out. Group those together or tie them into a knot and bring those out. We'll be using those as well. And finally, there's the dangling Hall Effect sensor board that also needs to come through the slot. The remaining wires should be taped down and tied together and coiled into a nice neat knot to stick back into the case. We won't be using them right now, but we may use them in the future for expansion. And now that all the relevant cabling is out of the slot, it's time to actually mount the board down. Now we'll be using the long end of the ground wire here. Make sure to run the screw through the ring terminal and put it in the hole opposite the end of the board sticking out of the metal box. Then run the ground cable back out the slot along with the other cables. Now congratulations, if you did all that, it should look something like this and you've accomplished quite a bit. There are still more challenges ahead, but at this point we're into 13 minutes and I'm sure I've fried your brains by now. So instead I'm gonna let you sit on it, watch it again, think about it, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask or make comments. And until next time, may the feeling of that rotor wash over you.